On June 27, 1940, as the Wehrmacht was marching through France, the U.S. began its final class of battleship, the 45, scratch that, 52,000 ton Iowa class. While sometimes called post-treaty ships, in fact, they were not. Design work began in 1938 after an addendum to the second London Treaty raised maximum displacement from 35,000 to 45,000 tons. Additions during construction, such as light and medium anti-aircraft and permanent ballasting, would raise their weight nearly 7,000 tons to reach their in-service standard displacement. It would be easy to assume the loosening of treaty restrictions would lead to a clean slate design, but this wasn't the case. Again, production speed was the priority, so improvements were only allowed where it didn't hinder construction rate. Originally, only four were to be built, but two more were added to the order to speed production. Despite this, production was actually a relatively moderate priority. This was because in the ramp up to war, and then during the first few years, the priority was finishing ships close to completion, repairing ships, and building more numerous smaller ships like destroyers, submarines, landing craft, and merchants that would have a larger impact on the war effort. As a result, the second pair were completed almost a year after the first two, and the third pair, along with the following Montana class, were never finished. There were many schools of thought on how to use the extra 10,000 tons. Most centered around the three fundamentals of armament, speed, or protection. Some wanted to use it to either add a fourth 16-inch turret or upgun them to 18-inch guns. Some wanted to increase armor. The side that finally went out was the one that lobbied for a higher speed. By lengthening the South Dakota's hull just over 200 feet, more powerful machinery could be mated with an improved length-to-beam ratio. As a result, these ships were essentially long-hauled South Dakotas. It is a glaring example of the complexities of hydrodynamic friction that this larger and finer hull, along with a nearly 60% increase in power, added only six knots to their top speed. Armament came in second for improvement. With battles still planned to take place at long ranges, originally it had been intended to fit these ships with the leftover 16-inch 50 caliber guns planned for the canceled South Dakota class of 1920. Unfortunately, there was a problem. Apparently, the Bureau of Ordnance, who designed the turrets, and the Bureau of Construction and Repair that designed the hull didn't get their numbers straight. As a result, almost comically, the turrets were two feet too wide. After the inevitable face palm, Ordnance quickly designed a new 16-inch 50 caliber gun and mount based on the previous 16-inch 45 caliber one. This turned out to be a very good gun that was highly accurate with a longer range while still using the same super heavy shells as the 16-inch 45 caliber, lightening the logistical load. Protection was virtually unchanged compared to the previous class in the four completed ships. The last two ships were to have received an improved TDS as well as the follow-on Montana class, which would have been truly free from treaty restrictions. But again, none of those were ever completed. Iowa was started June 27, 1940 and completed February 22, 1943. New Jersey was started September 16, 1940 and completed May 23, 1943. Missouri was started January 6, 1941, and completed June 11, 1944. Wisconsin was started January 25, 1941, and completed April 16, 1944. Illinois was started January 15, 1945, but canceled August 11, 1945, when 22% complete. Kentucky was started March 7, 1942, but suspended in June of 1942. Work started again December 6, 1944, but was suspended again February 17, 1947, when 45% complete. Work slowly started again August 17, 1948, but was finally canceled January 22, 1950. Main armament was nine 16-inch 50 caliber guns and three three-gun turrets. 
two forward, and one aft. Each mount weighed 1,708 tons. Maximum elevation was 45 degrees, yielding a maximum range of 21 miles. Loading was at 5 degrees, with the guns returning to that angle as they ran back out after recoiling 4 feet when fired. About 130 rounds were usually carried per gun. Powder was in 6 bags. Like the previous two classes, all three guns had full remote power control for both training and elevation. Again, about 80% of the bore length was chrome plated. Rate of fire was realistically about two rounds per minute per gun. Again, to save width, they used a downward swinging breech block. If you watch a video of them firing and notice white smoke coming out, it's because after firing, a burst of nitrogen was blown through the barrel to purge anything left over to prevent blowback when the breech was opened. The same ammunition and loadout percentages were used as the previous classes, so I won't go over them again. Secondary armament was again 20 of the 5 inch 38 caliber dual purpose gun in 10 twin turrets, 5 mounts on either side midship. Mounts 2 and 4 were one level above the main deck while mounts 1, 3, and 5 were two levels above the main deck. Propulsion was provided by eight boilers which vented to a pair of funnels. These drove steam to four turbines which generated 212,000 horsepower. Each drove one of the four propellers for a top speed of 33 knots. Again, two rudders were fitted. Protection was a virtual repeat of the previous South Dakota class with some improvements, especially in the second pair, continuing the all-or-nothing pattern. Side armor was again internal and sloped outward 19 degrees from bottom to top, stretching from turrets 1 to turret 3. At the keel where it started, it was 1.5 inch thick, gradually increasing to 6 inches, forming the third torpedo bulkhead of the TDS, also known as the lower belt. Just above the floor of the third deck, it became the main or upper belt and increased to 12 and a quarter inches up to the second deck, which was the armored deck. From the second deck up to the main deck, the hull plate was one and a half inch thick. The main deck was one and a half inch thick and meant to trigger any bomb hits. The second deck was again the armored deck, which capped the side armor. The armor was four and three quarter inch increasing to 5 inches over the inner layer of the TDS. The deck itself, which the armor sat on, was one and a quarter inch thick. The third deck was half an inch thick and meant to catch any splinters from getting into the ship's vitals. The ends of the armored box were formed by bulkheads 11 and a quarter inches thick increased to 14 and a half inches in Missouri and Wisconsin forward of turret 1 and 11 and a quarter inches thick aft of turret 3. Barbette armor was up to 17 and a quarter inches. Turret armor was 17 inches on the front and 9 and a half inches on the roof and sides. Conning tower armor was up to 17 inches. The TDS was again in four layers with the outer two being liquid filled and the inner two being air filled. Again, the lower belt formed the bulkhead between layers 3 and 4. The engine room was divided into 8 main compartments and readopted the unit principle. That is to say, the turbines and boilers were put in separate rooms opposing each other, with two boilers or one turbine in each room. From front to back, the order was boiler room, turbine room, boiler room, turbine room, boiler room, turbine room, boiler room, turbine room. Finally, they were triple bottomed, meaning they had two layers, with one layer usually liquid filled both for stability and to help cushion any underwater damage. Like their predecessors, three float planes could be launched off one of the two catapults at the stern. Again, there was no hangar. Modifications were limited to more light and medium anti-aircraft during the war, along with better radar and alterations to their bridge. During Korea, the number of light and medium anti-aircraft guns were reduced and then finally removed, even as electronics were improved. The float planes and their gear were also removed and replaced with spotter helicopters. 
also in the 50s, they were modified to carry the W23 Katy nuclear shell with a yield of 15 to 20 kilotons. When reactivated in the 80s, they were moderately modified. Electronics, electronic countermeasures, fire control, command, control, and communications and habitability were all updated. The engines were updated to burn modern fuel, though they were not converted to gas turbine. The stern was modified to handle newer helicopters for underway replenishment, but there was no support facilities. Unmanned drones for gunnery spotting could also be carried. Most obvious was the change in weapons. A platform was added midship. Two octuple launchers were added for 16 Harpoon anti-ship missiles. Eight quad armored box launchers were added for 32 Tomahawk land attack or anti-ship cruise missiles. Some of these may have been nuclear tipped, but of course the Navy's policy for neither confirming nor denying the presence of nuclear weapons on ships except ballistic missile subs means we may never know for sure and anyone that does is required to keep their mouth shut. If so, the warhead would have been the W-80 with dial a yield between 5 and 150 kilotons. Finally, four 20 millimeter Phalanx Sea Whiz Gatling guns, two on each side, were added. As weight compensation and to make room, two twin 5 inch 38 caliber mounts were removed from each side. Still, displacement rose to over 62,000 tons. Iowa completed workup and training in August of 1943 and headed north to counter any possible move by the German battleship Tirpitz. Returning to the east coast in mid-October, she carried President Roosevelt to Casablanca during which the comical William D. Porter affair occurred. Don't shoot, we're Republicans. Ah, good times. At the start of 1944, she and the now ready New Jersey, which would nominally be the flagship of New Jersey native Admiral William Halsey, transferred to the Pacific and took up the role of escorting the carriers and providing fire support for the rest of the war. First up was the Marshall's invasion. In mid-February, they took part in Operation Hailstone, the first raid on truck. While operating north of the island, they encountered a few small ships and got a chance to practice long-range gunnery. They moved on to cover raids on New Guinea and the second raid on truck in April, followed by the invasion of the Caroline Islands. At the start of June 1944, they covered the liberation of the Marianas and took part in the Battle of the Philippine Sea. In the third quarter of 1944, they covered the invasion of the Palau's. In October, the two covered the liberation of Leyte and took part in the massive Battle of Leyte Gulf. Joined by Wisconsin in early December of 1944, the three then covered the liberation of the northern Philippines and rode out Typhoon Cobra, where Iowa had one of her propeller shafts damaged, sending her back to the west coast for repairs, rest, and refit. New Jersey and Wisconsin, meanwhile, stayed with the fleet and started 1945 covering the battle for the northern Philippines and the carrier raids on the South China Sea, being joined by Missouri in mid-January 1945. Next, the three joined the invasion of Iwo Jima. At the start of April, they took part in the invasion of Okinawa. Off Okinawa, on April 11th, Missouri was hit just below the main deck by a kamikaze that did superficial damage. Despite the protest of some crew members, Captain Callahan, brother of Admiral Callahan, who was killed at the First Naval Battle of Guadalcanal, ordered the remains of the pilot, Kid Riley, be given a proper military burial at sea. A few days later, Iowa returned, allowing New Jersey to return to the west coast for overhaul that lasted until early July. All four ended the war escorting the carriers as they launched repetitive strikes against the Japanese home islands. As is well known, Missouri, named after the home state of President Truman, was the site of the surrender. A plaque on her deck commemorates the location that World War II officially ended. Post-war, only Missouri remained in frontline service, again named after President Truman's home state, while the others joined all the other battleships in training or reserve as Truman did his best to kill the Navy and disband the Marine Corps. On January 17, 1950, 
Missouri grounded, but despite urban legend, the damage was light. With the start of the Korean War, all four were deployed to provide fire support. With that war ceasing firing, all four were put in reserve. On May 6, 1956, Wisconsin collided with the destroyer, necessitating the replacement of her bow with the one from the stored hulk of her incomplete sister ship, Kentucky. On April 6, 1968, during the Vietnam War, New Jersey was recommissioned and provided fire support until again put back into reserve on December 17, 1969. In 1982, all four began reactivation. Refitted and rearmed, each would serve for about seven years. New Jersey shelled targets in Lebanon in 1984. On April 19, 1989, Iowa suffered a turret explosion in the middle gun of turret 2. Flooding of the magazine prevented major damage, but the subsequent blame game played by the Navy to cover up the use of 50-year-old powder ranks in my top four shame-on-you moments for the Navy. Missouri and Wisconsin took part in the Gulf War, mostly firing missiles and acting as a fleet in being off the Iraqi coast before joining Iowa and New Jersey back in reserve. All were decommissioned for the last time in the mid-90s post-Cold War drawdown. Missouri has been preserved as a memorial at Pearl Harbor just ahead of the remains of Arizona. New Jersey has been preserved as a memorial at Camden, New Jersey. Wisconsin is currently preserved as a museum at Norfolk. Iowa is on track to be preserved as a memorial at San Francisco.